On May 17th, 2024, Flex Radio has ceased the manufacturing of the 6,000 series radios. That's the 6,400 series and the 6,600 series. That just means we're not going to build them anymore. And we replace those with the currently announced 8,000 series radios. Don't get all worried. This is not going to obsolete your 6,000 series radios. We will continue to do hardware service for those radios. And we will also continue to develop software for that radio moving forward. Now for the 8,000 series radios, I've asked Steve Hicks, N5AC, the chief technical officer for Flex Radio Systems to join us and he can describe some of the features of the 8,000 series radios, why we ended up there and where we're going moving forward. Uh, Steve, without any further ado, let's get started. And uh, I'll read this out. What motivated Flex Radio to develop the 8,000 series as a successor to the 6,000 series? Well, there's a number of reasons, uh, you know, with any any kind of product that's a commercial uh, consumer product, uh, we always look at, you know, what can we do in the future and all that. Uh, customers are always interested in new capabilities and that sort of thing. The main motivator for switching platforms to the 8000 really was processing capabilities. Uh, if you look at what we did in the original 6000 series, we shopped around and picked the fastest processor and FPGA we felt like we could afford to put in the radio. Uh, but that was back in 2010, and it's 2024 now, so it's been a number of years since then. I mean, that the process that we have in the 6000 came out then. So that was really one of the key motivators was to get more horsepower inside the radio because we had this long laundry list of things that we would love to be able to do for our customers, and we've kind of run out of uh, horsepower in the 6000 to do some of those things. Great. Next one. Can you highlight any of the key differences between the 8,000 and the 6,000s uh, in terms of technology and performance? And you sort of touched on that as well. Yeah, so of course the processing is a really big deal. Uh, we've also looked at um, uh, GPS capability, GNSS systems. And so uh, we felt like we wanted to add that. Uh, the pricing of uh, integrating that inside the radio has come down a lot. So we wanted to put that in the radio. Uh, so that's the thing that we did. Uh, we also have added a number of other things. For example, the pre-selectors in the radio are now all solid state switched, and there's other capabilities as well. We put a uh, a sampler in there for adaptive pre-distortion. So really, there's there's not a single board in the radio that we haven't touched and revised and updated with new capabilities. Okay. Can you explain the differences between the GPS or the GPSDO that's certainly available in the 6000 series and the GNSS in the 8000, and of course the GPSDO in the 8000. Uh, I guess we have three different items. Yeah, so the uh, the original GPS that we put in the 6000 um, had a pretty hefty price tag on it, what we had to pay for that GPS receiver. And it was a single system unit, so it only works on the US GPS system. Uh, over time, uh, like anything else, the technology has moved forward there are uh, multiple other systems in, in addition to the US GPS system. Uh, there's uh, augmentation systems uh, that exist uh, on geostationary satellites and all that, which could provide an enhanced capability for the users. And we were able to get that at a price that allowed us to integrate it inside the radio. So uh, as a as a end user, what you'll see is you get that by default in the radio, it's included in the price. So that that's a very attractive thing and it keeps you always on frequency. Right. Uh, and I think uh, it all it should work for most people in the house. Yeah, we believe so. Uh, we haven't done extensive testing on that, but uh, the components and everything we've selected should allow that to work for most people inside the house. If it doesn't, you can always put an external antenna on it. All righty. Uh, how does the inclusion of the GNSS in the 8000 enhance its functionality compared to the GPS only system in the 6000? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, a GNS is, GNSS is a global umbrella for a system uh, that, that allows you to talk to multiple of these uh, position navigation and timing uh, satellite solutions. And so the one in the 8000 uh, actually works with a number of different systems. I have a slide on this if you want to show it uh, that yep. shows uh, the, all the systems that it touches. Um, yeah, here we go. And so uh, you can see it's uh, both the, the US system, the Russian GLONASS system, the European uh, Union Galileo system, and the Japanese QZSS system. And so this is a 32 channel receiver. It can track all these systems at the same time. 
In addition to that, the last column I have here says SBAS, which is a satellite-based augmentation. Uh, so these are geostationary satellites uh, that also add more reliability and accuracy to the system. So, uh, you know, this GPS receiver, of course, is uh, geared up for uh, position and navigation as well. Uh, but the sole purpose we use it for inside the radio is to go uh, discipline the oscillators and provide extremely accurate frequency coverage. Can you expand a bit on disciplining the oscillators, sort of the difference between a TCXO and how a GPS really helps with that? Yeah, so uh, every, uh, every radio that's made today that I'm aware of in the amateur world uses a crystal oscillator. Uh, so it's the sole base of that is a quartz crystal and crystals uh, over time will age, they'll drift off frequency. And there's both short-term and long-term characteristics to that drift. In the short term, the crystal can drift because of voltage or temperature or those kind of things. In the long term, though, there's crystal aging, which causes it over time to, to drift off frequency. And there's a number of things you can do to combat both of these. Uh, in the short uh, kind of uh, instability that you get, you can discipline the oscillator or you can um, do things to harden it against temperature and voltage changes. So a, a TCXO and an OCXO uh, have temperature control on them. Uh, to allow them to not move as the ambient temperature in the room changes. Like an OCXO has a heater in it, keeps it always warm. So if your room's cool or warm, uh, the crystal's not drifting around. Uh, but all of the solutions that you have are going to, uh, that are based on a crystal are slowly over time going to age and drift off frequency. So there's a number of ways to deal with this. Uh, some manufacturers will put a pot on the, uh, or a variable capacitor or something on the, the actual TCXO so you can change the frequency of it. So once every six months or a year, you open up your radio, uh, pull out a standard and twist that and make sure it's on frequency, which requires routine maintenance. In the Flex 6000, what we did is we put a uh, frequency lock loop around WWV. So you could tune your radio to WWV, press a button, and it would locate it and figure out how far off frequency it was, and then pull it back on frequency using software. Uh, what the GPS GNSS solution does is it always keeps it on frequency because the GPS or GNSS constellations always give you the exact uh, output <clears throat> in frequency, and you use that to keep the quartz oscillator uh, on the right frequency using a voltage control. Excellent. And I think I did the math on that. With the GNSS, we get about a half a hertz error at 50 megs, worst case scenario. Yeah, it, it keeps you very, very close on frequency. Right. And the GPSDO adds three orders of magnitude further precision. Yeah, and I think most people, yeah, most people that won't be a concern for, uh, but but with the GPS DO, one of the things we do is we provide a 10 megahertz output from your radio as well. So you can put the GPS DO in the radio. It does have better frequency accuracy than the included uh, GNSS receiver, uh, but it also gives you that 10 megahertz output, which you can use uh, as a basis for any microwave oscillators or other external equipment that you have to keep it on frequency. And of course, the higher in frequency you go, the more that the little errors uh, will contribute to that. So, you know, if you happen to be operating at two gigahertz or five gigahertz, it'll have a much more dramatic impact on staying on frequency. Yeah, you took a, and that's more for people who use transverters, the microwave work uh, type of thing. But for today's ham operator, they probably don't, uh, with the addition of the GNSS, we probably don't need the GPS DO. Yeah, we think for most HF operators, the included GNSS keeps them on frequency and does what it needs to do so they won't need anything else. Okay. This is an easy one. <clears throat> uh, will the 6,000 GPS do fit in the 8,000 radio? No is the answer to that. Uh, they are different devices. Uh, again, we, we did some work to pick one that we think works better in the 8,000. It has complete GNSS coverage as opposed to the 6,000, which was only a GPS solution. Okay. And the if I put a GPS DO in my 8000, it will override the GNSS? Correct. Because they're, they're different hardware, right? Okay. Yes, they are different hardware. And inside the, the uh, setup of the radio in the menus, uh, you have the option of telling it, I want to use the internal. Uh, there, there's also an internal TCXO in the radio. So in the event that your GPS, uh, your GNSS receiver uh, cannot receive anything, it falls back to the TCXO. But you get your choice in the software of picking that, the internal GNSS receiver, the GPS DO, or a 10 megahertz input if you happen to have one of those. Great. What specific performance improvements can users expect using the 8000 series compared to the 6000 series? 
Well, there's a number of things. Uh, in, in terms of base receiver performance, there's not a lot of difference today. Now we do have, uh, one of the things that we are doing is providing a lot of benefits in the visualization area. So if you've used a, a, a Flex 6000 or even a Spectrum Analyzer that you bought uh, you know, off the, uh, <clears throat> off the commercial market, You'll notice that as you zoom out and look at more and more spectrum, the noise floor of the instrument rises. And that's due to the way that the, um, the analysis software inside the radio or the spectrum analyzer works. And we've come up with a way to prevent that from happening and get an even better noise floor as you zoom out. So that's a key thing that you'll be able to see. You can zoom out to see the whole 20 meter or six meter band or whatever, and see all the way down to uh, a very narrow noise floor. Uh, which will let you see weaker signals and tell whether or not the band's open, that kind of thing. So that's one benefit. Uh, we also have things like uh, a complete uh, spectrum view that lets you see multiple bands at the same time, a spectrum overview. And then there's a bunch of other things that we'll be adding over time, like enhanced noise uh, reduction capabilities and uh, those kinds of features. Okay, moving forward. How has the software, particularly smart SDR, evolved to take advantage of the hardware advancements? Uh, you may have touched on a bit of this already, but what are, what are we going to see? But of course, adaptive free distortion is one of the major ones. Yeah, so we're always working on smart SDR and adding new capabilities to it. And, and certainly some of what we're going to do uh, over the next year involves adding some of the features that we've announced uh, back into the radio, into the 8,000 and releasing those. So. Smart SDR is under, under continual improvement. We're always adding things. Uh, adaptive pre-distortion is an example of that. Both of the spectrum capabilities I just mentioned are, are examples of that. And the improved noise uh, reduction techniques we're going to uh, add that we've been working on in the lab into the Smart SDR, another example of that. That's cool. Sounds exciting. New user, for new users transitioning from a 6,000 to an 8,000 series, what learning curve should they anticipate? And how are we supporting them? Yeah, there's really not a lot. I mean, if, if you look as we add features to the radio, uh, those things will have new menu controls and things like that. But the 8000 acts just like the base 6000 in terms of uh, how the menus work, how the hookup works, uh, how the software behaves, all those kind of things. So you can, if you're an existing 6000 user, you can pick an 8000 up off the shelf and it's going to operate uh, pretty much just like what you expect. Excellent. And one last question, and this is the fairy tale question. Looking forward, what future enhancements or updates can we expect for the 8000 that will begin to push the boundaries now? now I know there's one of them, the 40 kilohertz wide receiver part. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with uh, wider bandwidths on HF. Uh, it's just a lot of the, the R&D work that we've done here over the last several years. And we saw some real uses of that in the amateur world. One of those is... Uh, if you look at FT8, FT8 today is limited to about three kilohertz. Now you can move around and try and call people in other, other frequencies, but uh, as a practical matter, everyone's looking in that three kilohertz and the expectation is you'll work people there. And we feel like, you know, if you look at the band, everybody's crowded into that section of band. So one of the things we want to do with our wide bandwidth capability is expand that to 40 kilohertz, which is one thing that we've done in 8,000. And that'll allow you to send and receive uh, FT8 over 40 kilohertz bandwidth and you don't have to be a uh, another have another flex radio to talk to somebody. The way that the technology works, somebody else can move off of frequency, and you can work them. Uh, so it's a, it's a really great new technology, and we're hoping to expand that area. Uh, we're also going to take uh, the software that we develop uh, for that capability on the client side and make that available open source, so other manufacturers can take advantage of it over time. Right. Um... Before everybody gets excited, by the way, you might want to uh, elaborate on the fact that we're not breaking any FCC three kilohertz rules here on the transmit side, correct? Yeah, so uh, the the FCC rules, as you mentioned, have not changed and you have to still stay within that three kilohertz bandwidth or 2800 uh, hertz, whatever it is in your country. And so uh, what we're doing here is we're allowing you uh, on the transmit side to transmit multiple carriers inside that 40 kilohertz uh, but what the radio will do is ensure that each one of those meets the FCC requirements or whatever your country is uh, to make sure that you're staying within that three kilohertz bandwidth. So you can't transmit a single six kilohertz carrier, but you can transmit multiple carriers that are a kilohertz wide or something like that. Okay. And I have one question I think we missed. Uh, we didn't expand much on adaptive pre-distortion. This is new. Um, we have, and the 
uh, CSI initiative with, from ARRL, which is the Clean Signal Initiative. We are uh, involved with that quite a bit. And uh, Steve, can you, uh, I know you've got a couple of slides. You want me to bring this one up? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, this kind of relates to uh, a problem that we see on sideband transmissions where uh, this is using, what I've drawn here in this picture is a standard two-tone test here. So the red lines, this would be a spectrum view. The red lines would be the fundamentals in a two-tone test. And you see these, uh, these blue uh, intermodulation products that occur to the side of that. And you don't have to be transmitting just two tones. Your voice contains multiple frequencies in it. And when you speak on sideband, you get a similar uh, a growth outside of your your predefined whatever bandwidth you're in 2800 hertz three kilohertz whatever and so this is caused by the power amplifier in your radio and what we want to do is to remove as much of that as we can so you have a cleaner signal uh, on transmission and so that's what adaptive predistortion is all about and we have this in the 8000 series and it uh, will take the uh, output from the pa compare it to what we intended to send and make adjustments inside the radio in real time uh, to get a cleaner signal on the output. And the idea is to force these IND products way down into the noise. Okay. Uh, you have another slide, I believe, that shows the different, uh, you know, stick man setups for uh, different radios here. Uh, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, adaptive predistortion is going to work in a number of different configurations with the 8000. Uh, the first one we show here on the left is the standalone configuration. And in this uh, scenario, we have a sampler that's built inside the radio that uses the feedback from that sampler uh, created by the PA uh, to, to uh, linearize the, the uh, power amplifier. So in this case, you can get the benefits of adaptive predistortion with just the radio at 100 watts connected to an antenna. In the middle, we're showing how this works with the PGXL, our 1500 watt amplifier. And here there's an output on the back of the PGXL that'll run over to the 8000 and uh, linearize it using just a single cable. So if you use the, the Flex Radio uh, PGXL along with the 8000, it'll work in this scenario. Now, not everybody uses a PGXL for their amplifier. So if you have a third party amplifier, uh, we have a uh, sampler that we've designed that can go on the output of the amplifier and have a feedback cable just like what's there on the 6000. And this will give you the pre-distortion capability with an external amplifier. So there's three different ways to use this depending on your setup and your power level. Right. And that cable is uh, just a um, 50 ohm cable with BNC connectors on it, I believe. So, uh, yes. Now, in the latter case with the sampler, uh, the cable uh, needs to be a TNC to BNC cable. And we did that okay. because uh, uh, if I show you what the sampler looks like, it has a unique uh, capability. Let me see if I find it. Here we go. Yeah. So, here in the sampler, uh, you know, I've kind of got a Gazenta and a Gazauta here for the RF power. So, the RF power from your amplifier goes in the left side and comes out the right side. Uh, but one of the things that we have here is a, uh, a capability of using the receiver port on the 8000 when you're not transmitting. So what you would do here is use the left connector, which says RXN to connect your existing receive antenna. So let's say you have a K9AY loop or a beverage or something like that. You could connect it to that left connector that's pointed towards you. The right connector, which is a TNC, the cable would go from that over to your radio for the linearization path. And then there's a, an RCA connector here, which goes back to a connector on the radio that switches when it's in transmit and receive. And by doing this, we keep from using up the, the receive port on the radio that we would normally use for an external linearizer and sampler. That's awesome. It's been a pretty common question uh, in the forums. Um, and one last thing in adaptive predistortion, the radios will come out first, the software to support will come out uh, shortly after, we hope? Yes. Yeah, we have, we've published a roadmap that lists a number of capabilities that we're going to have over time, and we'll be releasing those out the course of, uh, over the course of 2024 after we release the radio. Perfect. Well, Steve, I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, I know it's been a busy week, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. All right. Thanks, Mike. Okay. 7-3, everybody. 7-3.